Welcome back, everyone. This is Greg with SportsRehabExpert.com. Today, we're going to be talking about hip impingement, anterior or front side hip pain in the front of your hip joint, or what is commonly referred to as FAI, or femoral acetabular impingement. Now, a lot of people will get pain in the front of their hip and be diagnosed with this FAI, but they'll also receive imaging, and the imaging may or may not say that they have bony changes. Oftentimes, I'll see people in the clinic who the doctors are kind of confused because they're like, well, your image doesn't show any type of bony growth, but your symptoms would correlate with those who do have some type of femoral or acetabular change in their anatomy where you would see that potentially this is problematic. Not always the case. Certainly people who have some type of x-ray or imaging findings that have bony changes don't necessarily experience pain. And there isn't always a one-to-one -one correlation with that image to someone's painful experience. But you'll also, I see a number of people in the clinic who have been told that there is no change that has happened on their image, but yet they still have the same symptoms of front side hip pain, pain while sitting, tightness, tension in the front of their hip socket all the time, usually, again, worse with sitting or any type of squatting type movements. So again, very similar symptom presentation to those who do have FAI diagnosis upon imaging, but yet their images come out clean, meaning no bony changes have occurred. So this video is going to be for those who have experienced FAI or femoral acetabular impingement like symptoms upon imaging, there is no bony changes that have occurred. Now, if you're watching this video, and you have had an image, and they do say that bony changes have occurred, maybe you have a cam impingement or a pincer type impingement of bony growth. That doesn't mean that this video is useless for you. A lot of these concepts are also very helpful for those who have cam, pincer, or a mixed lesion, because again, imaging that you have on x-ray doesn't necessarily always correlate to your symptoms 100% or one-to-one. -one. There's not an equal correlation there. And a lot of times people who have symptoms, irregardless of any type of bony change that is occurring, by following a set of concepts and principles to help manage this pain and potentially even get rid of this pain completely. So why might someone have pain in the front of their hip if there is no type of bony changes that are occurring? Well, we need to understand movement, we need to understand how muscles act, how joints act, and how the two influence one another to get a better understanding of why someone might constantly be experiencing some type of tension symptom in their hip. So I'll throw an image of the iliopsoas up there just so you can get a better idea of uh, the anatomy than what my uh, makeshift model will help you understand with too. But this, this is useful from a movement perspective just to get a better idea of the joints underneath of the muscle tissue and how the two play a role with one another. You hear people talking about psoas pain all the time or your psoas is contributing to the issue, but nobody ever speaks to why that is. They just tell you that it's a problem and you don't understand why that problem exists. Well, it's because of how the joints move underneath of the muscle and how that impacts your length tension relationship. So uh, if someone is, uh, again, this, this red TheraBand here is going to simulate the psoas. It attaches up at the lumbar spine and then down around the neck of the femur here where my hand is. So anytime that I tow my foot out or externally rotate the femur, you can see how that's going to wind the psoas up and put tension onto the psoas simply by towing the foot out or being more externally oriented in their femur. So those individuals who really tow out when they're sitting, uh, they really sit wide thighed, toes pointing out. They, they do that in standing all the time too. You're constantly putting a stretch onto the psoas simply by turning your feet out. Furthermore, these people also tend to shift their center of mass forward, meaning their hips are out in front of their heel. Uh, so looking at this from a side view, 
the more you shift forward here and the more the femur is relatively back behind the, the pelvis, now you're going to experience tension through the front here again too. So you're winding tension up both by turning the foot outward, but then also shoving the hips forward. That puts a lot of tension. Again, you, your, your hip does not move this much. This is a terrible model. Your hip's not gonna dislocate like this, but if you were to move to this extreme, you can again see the tension being pulled on the band. So again, don't become fearful because this model moves a whole heck of a lot more than what your actual pelvis and what your actual femur does. But understand that these small, minute changes in your position and how you orient your center of mass are going to influence muscular tension. And that's all that I'm trying to get across in this video is that the way you orient your body through movement in space, through exercise, and even stationary, static, sitting, standing, walking, that is going to influence the length tension relationship to the psoas. And if you're always putting that psoas on stretch and pulling that rubber band taut 24 seven, and you never give it a time to allow it to actually contract in the opposite way or take away that pulled taut tension more towards, uh, again, think of like a rubber band. So a rubber band, you can pull it taut. It has its normal kind of resting tension. Um, the one thing a rubber band doesn't do is it doesn't contract further. Your muscle can also kind of contract where the muscles will slide uh, between one another and actually shorten. So that's one thing that a rubber band doesn't do. It just pulls tension here. It has its normal resting length tension relationship, but then a muscle of your tissue can also shorten and contract as well. So you need that full spectrum of movement experience at your hip joint, at the psoas. There's other muscles to consider here as well too, such as your rectus femoris that goes from the knee all the way up from the bottom up. All of these things matter from a length tension relationship standpoint. And these are the things that you have to consider as far as treating when you're trying to overcome any type of femoral acetabular or anterior hip pain. So what is the solution to this? Everybody wants a video of three exercises you can do. I'm gonna put a couple things up here that you can do, but again, realize that this is very individual of what someone's current capacity and level of capability is, and it's very dependent on where your starting point is and how to progress someone through that. It's not as simple as putting some generalized YouTube video up. This is why you're running into probably static, or no results whatsoever is because everything you're receiving on YouTube or online is all generalized. And you also, when you go to see somebody in person, they don't have a better understanding of biomechanics or muscle length tension relationships in the first place. So they don't know how to help you out either. This is why you need someone who understands the issue to give you a personalized game plan. And that's what we do at Sports Rehab Expert. And you can receive that if you email me at greg at sportsrehabexpert.com and we'll talk about the costs and everything associated with that. But if you want some key takeaways from this video and what you can start doing now, again, there's three approaches to this and this is what we would talk about a little bit more on the game plan too, is one, what are you doing every single day? So whether that's sitting, standing, walking, are you doing something every single day that is potentially causing an increase in your symptoms simply by how you orient your, your joints and your muscle tissue? So changing your lifestyle habits is not sexy, nor is it fun. It can be tedious, but it is necessary if you're trying to change your symptoms sometimes. You have to stop picking at the scab to allow that sort of tension, those symptoms to start calming down. So then you can start applying some type of physical movement on top of that in a non-irritable fashion. We do things that would bring your center of mass backwards to take some of that tension off of the system. We do things that help internally rotate the body in a comfortable way. We'd work muscle groups such as your adductors, your pelvic floor, your lower abdomen, your hamstrings, your glutes, all things while paying attention to the underlying joint orientation underneath of it. Because if you just do hamstring exercises, adductor exercises, but you never pay attention to the position of the pelvis, the femur in its relationship to the torso, you're never being mindful of the length tension relationships in the first place. You're just simply doing exercises. So again, you have to dig a layer deeper if you are trying to solve these issues. It's not simply just giving you three exercises that are gonna solve all the world problems. 
It's number one, removing provocative factors. Number two, changing the position tendencies that you have from a postural standpoint. And then three, rebuilding the capacity of you to tolerate a variety of movements through a full spectrum of motion as your body allows you to tolerate that movement or that exercise.